2019 has been an incredible year in AI and deep learning, with many advancements demonstrating the power of this technology. Generative models have reached new heights, with models like Gaugan creating photorealistic landscapes from pixel maps with a novel spatially adaptive normalization layer developed by researchers at NVIDIA. NVIDIA researchers have also developed StyleGAN 2, creating undetectably realistic faces. The advances of DeepFakes has inspired a $1 million DeepFake Kaggle competition. DeepFake detection has also inspired a projection algorithm in the StyleGAN 2 paper as well from the researchers at NVIDIA. Self-supervised learning has taken on the form of knowledge distillation to leverage unlabeled data in Facebook's semi-supervised learning framework, scaling up the use of this unlabeled data in order to you know, achieve state-of-the-art accuracy in image net classification and this kind of stuff, also used by Google in self-training with Noisy Student, and we'll also look at some other ways self-supervised learning has evolved. Neural architecture search has also developed new architectures like the efficient net model using compound scaling, the efficient detection model that uses a similar approach with compound scaling, and also we've seen the MobileNet V3 and MobileNet Edge TPU to have these uh, neural networks optimized for mobile and edge deployment. This has also been the year of transformer language models, using these pre-trained language models, things like you know BERT developing up into XLNet and GPT-2, and all these interesting things. You can test it out with Talk to Transformer. Another interesting trend has been to control the output of language models with things like Salesforce Control, Uber's Plug and Play, and OpenAI's fine tuning with reinforcement learning. We've also seen a lot of interesting cases of using reinforcement learning for gameplay, like OpenAI's hide and seek agents, uh, things like Dota 2, DeepMind's Alpha Star, and all of these different papers, Facebook using uh, like a poker agent and Hanabi, all these different cases of using reinforcement learning for game playing. We've also seen some really interesting papers challenging the way we think about neural networks, like the lottery ticket hypothesis, showing these sparse sub-networks exist that can achieve the same accuracy as the dense architecture, and then papers like weight agnostic neural networks that show that you can search for these uh, neural networks that can perform control tasks with random weights. We've also seen a lot of interesting developments in the PyTorch and TensorFlow frameworks, uh, the integration of new APIs like distributed training in TensorFlow, and then quantization in PyTorch. We've also seen a really interesting company, Hugging Face, implement a lot of these transformer language models and make it easier to get started with using them yourself on custom data sets. There's also been a lot of interesting position papers like Francois Chalet's On the Measure of Intelligence and Jeff Kloon's AIGAs and Yashua Bengio's talk on System 1 to System 2 deep learning, talking about combining perception and reasoning. Thanks for watching this summary of AI in 2019, looking at it heading into 2020. One of the most interesting papers that came out this year was a lottery ticket hypothesis finding sparse trainable neural networks that won the ICLR 2019 Best Paper Award. This paper showed that when you have a dense architecture, you can find a sparse subnetwork within the architecture such that you can train this sparse subnetwork from scratch to reach the same accuracy as the dense architecture. And the key insight here is that in order to do this, in order to train the sparse network from scratch, you need to retain the same initialization that you use to train this dense network. So neural network pruning has been something that's been known about, where you have the dense architecture where, say, a node in a previous layer is connected to every other node in the preceding layer, and then you prune away some edges such that you have a sparse network, meaning that every node is not connected to every node in the next layer. So what they show in this paper is how to train these sparse networks from scratch and achieve the same accuracy as the dense architecture. The lottery ticket hypothesis from Frankel and Carbon find these lottery tickets on networks like fully connected networks, small convolutional networks, and resnets on vision tasks like CIFAR-10 and MNIST. Facebook researchers further explored the generalization of lottery ticket networks by exploring this phenomenon on things like natural language processing and reinforcement learning tasks, as well as generalizing this concept across datasets and different optimizers. Researchers at Uber further looked at the lottery tickets, deconstructing lottery tickets, zero signs, and a super mask. In this paper, they're looking at different ways that you can prune these neural networks. And one thing that they find that's really interesting in this chart is that you can have these networks that have random weights, and then you have the learned mask or the pruning mask, and you can still achieve something like 41% accuracy on CIFAR-10 classification. Researchers from the University of Washington and the Allen Institute further looked at this idea of having lottery tickets and randomly weighted networks. In this paper, they're parameterizing the ways that they're gonna search for the lottery tickets or the subnetworks within dense architectures to achieve really high accuracies using random weights in these dense architectures just by forming the straight-through estimator and doing gradient descent to search for subnetworks within dense architectures. 
Along a similar vein is exploring what you can do with a randomly weighted network and pruning to find the subnetwork within the randomly weighted network. Weight agnostic neural networks from Adam Geyer and David Ha at Google Brain explore what you can do with a randomly weighted neural network and you are searching for the network that can make sense of the random weights. So in this case, you have these networks with random weights and they're performing control tasks like open AI gym, bipedal walking, and car racing. So they have these different inputs that they use in order to control things like steering the car, applying the gas, applying brakes, or applying different forces on the different joints of the bipedal walking agent. So in this case, they have the random weights, they're weight agnostic, but what they do is they use the neuroevolution of augmenting topologies, the NEAT algorithm, in order to have this neuroevolution architecture search to figure out how to connect the input nodes when they have random weights in order to perform these control tasks. And they also scale this up to MNIST classification. Another paper that came out this year, Developing the Way That We Understand Neural Networks, challenges papers like Neural Architecture Search by exploring randomly wired or randomly connected neural networks. So in this case, they're exploring just randomly connecting the same operation between different nodes and neural networks, and they're using a graph generation algorithm, sort of something that you would use in network science, in order to just generate these uh, neural networks and then have them be trained for like ImageNet classification. So this paper from researchers at Facebook challenges the way that we think about neural architecture search and maybe emphasizing more the importance of structuring the search space, the cell search space, compared to different algorithms for traversing that space. Campaign by leaders in the field like Yang Lacoon, self-supervised learning has also made a lot of advances in 2019 in AI. Self-supervised learning describes ways of constructing supervised learning tasks from unlabeled data. Examples of this lately have been to try to flip knowledge distillation where you have a teacher network predict a label distribution over an unlabeled image for a student network to learn that distribution, which has been used by Facebook in billion scale semi-supervised learning where they're using these 3.5 billion weekly labeled Instagram images in order to improve the accuracy of image net classification. Google has taken a similar approach with self-training with Noisy Student, which has reached a new uh, state-of-the-art in ImageNet, and they've also presented uh, papers from Facebook in self-supervised learning like wave to vec for audio applications and this closed task to improve the question-answering systems and to make more use of their data. Facebook's billion-scale semi-supervised learning framework is a technique to move beyond labeled data sets in the framework of this self-supervised learning. So the way that they do this is they have their labeled data set, like the ImageNet data set, and they train the teacher model, which is a large capacity model, that then predicts a label distribution over unlabeled data, and then they use this unlabeled data to train the uh, target model, the student network, to predict that same label distribution that the teacher had labeled the unlabeled data with. So this is the way that they're constructing the self-supervised learning task in order to learn from unlabeled data. Google took a similar approach using self-supervised learning in the form of knowledge distillation to make use of a 300 million JFT unlabeled image dataset. In this case, they're scaling up different models of their efficient net architectures. Their efficient net architectures naturally form this family of models because they're scaled up by using this search compound scaling rule, which we'll get into more later. They also introduced the idea of having noise with respect to doing this knowledge distillation pipeline to further improve upon this result. They achieved the new ImageNet state-of-the-art at 87.4% top one accuracy using the self-supervised learning framework as knowledge distillation. Also in self-supervised learning, Facebook released wave to vec state-of-the-art speech recognition through self-supervision. Using a similar technique like how you train these word embeddings and these natural language processing models, they train these speech recognition models and they were able to achieve a 22% improvement over DeepSpeech 2 while using two orders of magnitude less labeled data. So using the self-supervised pre-training approach, they're able to surpass these supervised systems and achieve higher accuracy on these speech recognition tasks. Facebook also presented a self-supervised learning algorithm to use the closed task in order to train question answering natural language processing systems. So an example of this is when you have sentences like this, like the Broncos took an early lead in Super Bowl 50 and never trailed blah blah blah, you could mask out words to form question answering uh, data points for this labeled supervised learning in this form of taking unlabeled data and forming a supervised learning task that is fully automated. So an example of this is if you blank out, say the blank took an early lead in Super Bowl 50 and never trailed, then you can have the question who took an early lead in Super Bowl 50 and have the masked out word as the labeled data point. Google also published a study on self-supervised visual representation learning, seeing how the representations learned and how this kind of downstream performance varies across different architectures from the RevNet 50 to ResNet 50 V1 and V2. So the way that they're doing this is they're looking at different self-supervised tasks, like where you rotate an image and then predict the rotation angle, the exemplar where you use data augmentation to form these auxiliary classes and then predict these auxiliary classes, and then relative patch location where you take an image and you treat it like a puzzle 
and you pull out the different patches and then you try to have the model uh, predict the relative patch. So the difference between relative patch and then this fourth task, jigsaw. Jigsaw is where you're like completely putting the puzzle back together and relative patch location is more of like a contrastive task where you're just kind of comparing two patches with one another. So in the study, they're showing this variance between different architectures on different self-supervised learning tasks. Another interesting paper along the theme of self-supervised learning or making use of unlabeled data for supervised learning performance is this paper, Data Efficient Image Recognition with Contrastive Predictive Coding from researchers at DeepMind. This plot shows the results of their technique. Most interestingly is this valley over here where you have this sort of in-between between labeled and then unlabeled data where you want to take advantage of these kind of self-supervised learning tasks. But they also do uh, see like an increase over the maximally uh, where you have the entire labeled data set. So their technique uses this uh, comparison of the intermediate patches of images doing this kind of a density estimation, estimating the likelihood of patches belonging to the same image in order to improve upon uh, these representations learned from neural networks. Another interesting paper is unsupervised data augmentation for consistency training. In this paper, what they're doing is they're taking the unlabeled data and they're doing data augmentation to it and then comparing the consistency between how these data, set, these data points are classified after they've been augmented compared to how they were augmented. So these different kinds of augmentations like RAND augment for image and then back translation for natural language processing data. And they do this in order to increase the performance of these models by having them be consistent across augmentations. Another interesting algorithm for this is large-scale adversarial representation learning, or the big BIGAN model. The way that this works with unlabeled data and forming a representation that can be used for downstream tasks is you have the generative adversarial network that produces images from random code. So you have this Z vector that you use in order to produce images. So the generator maps from this Z vector into images. The idea of the big BIGAN model is to also introduce this encoder and then restructure the discriminator such that the encoder takes real images and it maps them into the source vector that might produce them. So the idea here is that when you have these source vectors, these Z vectors, they're sort of these low dimensional vector representations of images. So you can use these representations in order to train downstream uh, tasks in order to do things like image net classification or object detection or semantic segmentation. So this is an interesting framework for using these generative adversarial networks in order to learn representations on unlabeled data sets. This infographic from Sebastian Ruder's Natural Language Processing Newsletter gives a great overview of the different language models that came out in 2019. Many of these language models are variants of the BERT transformer model. For example, the XLNet is a different way of structuring the language modeling task, whereas BERT uses the bidirectional context to encode and do this pre-training where you're predicting mass tokens, XLNet has this permutation language model, which is a different way of uh, structuring the way that you mask words and then use context to predict other words in the sequence. They also use a transformer Excel model and use more data in their experiments. The Roberta model from Facebook looks at the way that you train BERT and iterates on like longer training time, things like uh, different hyperparameters, and other things that show that the BERT model is pretty good if you just you know really investigate it and tune it to different tasks. Other models like XLM examine this kind of a cross-lingual and other things like these massively multilingual models from uh, you know research groups like Google, and then other, the probably the biggest thing that came out was the GPT-2. The GPT-2 model was the most famous language model released in 2019, probably because of the stage release technique that OpenAI used to deploy this model. They started off by releasing a 345 million parameter version of GPT-2, citing that the 1.5 billion parameter model would be too dangerous, and that they needed to approach releasing it into the public with caution. But the paper covers this idea that these unsupervised language models are actually already able to do these multitasks, things like question answering or reading comprehension, summarization, these kinds of things naturally as a result of the, uh, of the language modeling task. So what they do is they scale up their GPT, uh, the GPT original model by using a 10 times larger data set, a data set that's collected by uh, going through Reddit posts. And then if it has, say, three upvotes or more, they scrape that link and then add it to their data set for use in the language modeling task and they show that uh, doing this kind of language modeling can already perform some of these other tasks. Hence the name of their paper is like uh, unsupervised language models are natural multitask learners or something like that. Another interesting app that came out is talktransformer.com built by Adam King. The way that this works is you can see it with a prompt and then you can click on complete text to get a look at kind of what these transformer models uh, look like and what they do. So you can see you see it with something like welcome to the year 2020 and then it starts uh, filling out the paragraph using this language modeling. So our voice starts becoming clearer, and you see kind of what this uh, language modeling task is able to do, seeding it with different prompts.
Another interesting area of research with respect to these large transformer language models is to try to find ways that you can control the output of these language models when they're generating things like paragraphs or other kind of ways of generating text. Some of these interesting examples are Salesforce's control model, Uber's plug and play language models, and then OpenAI's blog post on fine tuning GP2 by using reinforcement learning. And you can get an example of playing with this by using the hugging face implementation of Uber's plug and play model where you can try to uh, steer the way that the language model is generating text. There's also been a lot of work into the ways that you can compress these large language models to make them more efficient to run on things like mobile devices or edge devices. One example of this is Facebook AI's adaptive attention span, which formulates a new way of structuring the attention heads in these transformer networks to make them more efficient. This blog post from Mitchell Gordon shows all the different ways you can compress BERT with the pipeline of things like pruning, weight factorization, knowledge distillation, weight sharing, quantization, and the idea of compressing the BERT with the pre-training as well as downstream tasks. So this has a checklist of different papers that look at different ways to compress BERT. And probably the most famous way of compressing language models has been Hugging Face's Distill BERT uh, paper, where they're looking at a way to do this knowledge distillation to have a smaller model that can still retain the information in the large-scale BERT transformer model. This year has also seen a lot of interesting advancements in generative modeling, using neural networks in order to produce data like image data or speech data. In this case, the NVIDIA has developed a model called StyleGAN2 that's able to develop super realistic facial images. In this paper, they're addressing concerns with the StyleGAN1 model, where they are able to identify artifacts like these water droplets or these phase artifacts that are able to be used to tell if an image was produced by StyleGAN or if it's a real image. You can see some examples of these faces on thispersondoesnotexist.com. Another really interesting generative modeling technique that came out this year is SYNGAN, the winner of the ICCV 2019 Best Paper. You can see how by using a single image, SYNGAN is able to produce new images that resemble this image but then still have these slight variances that have come to be associated with these generative adversarial networks. So for example, in this mountain image, it's able to create these new styles of uh, this mountain image from just from the single image training sample. So in this case, they're using the multiple scales of the image in order to produce new images from a single image. And they're also able to do this for things like paint to image, editing, harmonization, where you add in some new uh, object and then kind of blend it in with the original image, and things like super resolution and animation. Another really exciting advancement in generative modeling is the Gaugan model, able to turn these pixel map images, sort of like what you get from a semantic segmentation model, into photorealistic images by using a novel spatially adaptive normalization layer in order to convert the styles of this photorealistic image into the pixel maps as the input source. So what they do this is they have this uh, spatially adaptive normalization layer that controls the batch normalization parameters like the mean and the variant, the mean and the bias that they use in order to inject into these intermediate feature maps of the generator that is going from this pixel map input into these photorealistic images. Another cool example of generative modeling was this paper from Samsung AI that is able to produce these realistic neural talking heads by using their generative modeling framework. Another cool application of generative models that are able to generate training data or data such as images and speech and this kind of stuff from random noise is generative teaching networks, a meta-learning algorithm developed at Uber. This is a really interesting framework that uses the generator to generate data set for the learning network such that you have this data set that is optimized to train these networks as fast as possible. So it's a really interesting uh, framework for integrating these generative networks into the loop with uh, meta-learning and things like neural architecture search in order to train better models and achieve higher performance overall with this AI GA system as described by Jeff Kloon that's able to generate its own training data and then form new learning environments. This year there's also been a lot of interesting cases of using reinforcement learning for game playing, such as this paper from OpenAI, Emergent Tool Use for Multi-Agent Interaction. One interesting characteristic of the hide-and-seek OpenAI agents is the architecture of the policy network. This kind of a transformer architecture, similar to what you'd see in like a BERT or GPT-2, kind of deployed into this reinforcement learning hide-and-seek environment is really interesting. So another interesting characteristic is they detail this sequence of emergent behaviors. So at first the agents move randomly, then the seeking agents learn, and learn to uh, chase the hiders in order to get their reward. The hiders learn that they can pick up these boxes and then go and block the doors so that the uh, seekers can't get them. And then the seekers learn to grab the ramps, the ramps in order to get into the enclosure and find the hiding agents. And then finally, the hiding agents learn to grab the ramp and bring it into their enclosure such that the uh, seekers can't possibly get them. And then they just learn how to coordinate this and do it even quicker and more efficiently.
There's also been a lot of interesting cases of reinforcement learning taking on complex games like StarCraft II and Dota and Quake and these kinds of games. This paper, Alpha Star from DeepMind, has a really interesting tournament style of play in order to train these networks and make sure they're not overfitted in the self-play kind of training framework. This other paper from DeepMind, Capture the Flag, is a really interesting case of doing this pixels to actions and another example of reinforcement learning for game playing in 2019 that has this really interesting uh, architecture for the agent for mapping from pixels into decisions. Dota 2, the uh, algorithm from OpenAI, has a lot of really interesting details about how they built their OpenAI 5 agent. One interesting characteristic is their net-to-net -net system, which is how they save efficiency and how they do this kind of uh, training the model for 10 months by making sure they don't waste that previous computation when they want to iterate on their model, say, introduce more inputs or scale up the model architecture size and things like this. Another interesting paper is DeepMind's Mu0 algorithm, which is doing planning sort of like a tree search, like, uh, you know, a traditional kind of algorithm for things like chess and uh, checkers, where you have this kind of a tree to plan out different uh, moves that you might make. But the way that they're doing this is having a learned model, so they don't have an initial dynamics model of the environment. Rather, they learn this model, this dynamics model, and then they do this to do planning, and they apply this to Atari, Go, Chess, and Shogi. OpenAI's solving Rubik's Cube with a robotic hand is one of the most interesting cases of reinforcement learning and training agents in simulation. In this example, what they do is they use an automatic domain randomization algorithm in order to have these uh, randomized environments be as diverse as possible, such that the agent generalizes to the real world. The way that they do this is that they have an automated curriculum that's learning the way to scale up parameters in the physics simulation. So when the uh, robotic hand is learning the control policy that you know, rotates and turns the cube, it's sort of being uh, trained in these different environments with different physics, and the uh, simulator is having this meta-learning algorithm that isn't just, uh, say, randomizing the different styles of the physics, but rather it's learning a curriculum to have sort of a structure to the way that the physics in the simulation is randomized. So another interesting characteristic of this system is that it isn't just a uh, like one neural network that controls the entire thing. They have different models. They have the uh, pol policy control network that is actually controlling the robotic hand to move the Rubik's Cube. Then they have the vision model that gets sort of the state of the cube. And then they have a symbolic AI solver that's you know making a decision of how to actually rotate the cube. There's also been a lot of interesting work in robotics and reinforcement learning from labs like UC Berkeley that have collaborated with Stanford and CMU and UPenn in order to construct this RoboNet data set which is an objective to have this kind of a transfer learning from learning movement from different viewpoint angles. They've also published this deep dynamics model, which is sort of a planning model doing a similar thing to the OpenAI Rubik's Cube, rotating these balls in place. Uh, they also post this model-based reinforced learning from pixels, sort of doing these different movements, and then things like imitating human demonstrations with a cycle GAN, which is really cool, where they take these human demonstrations and they use that same cycle GAN that you've probably seen the video of translating the horse to the zebra or the oranges to the apples, but here they're using that in order to translate this human demonstration into a robotic arm demonstration, which can then be used in imitation learning, training data kind of thing to train these robotic arms to perform these tasks. Also interestingly is Google AI's uh, learning to toss robot that learns how to uh, learns the physics of tossing these things like bananas into a bin. Another interesting framework to reinforce and learning came out this year, developed by one of the pioneers of AI, Jurgen Schmidhuber, training agents using upside down reinforce and learning. Upside down reinforcement learning is a new way of mapping from, say, uh, states to actions by rather having this kind of a value function like a Q learning algorithm that's predicting the value of different states and then making greedy actions to sort of take you to the states with the highest expected reward. The way that the behavior function in upside down reinforcement learning works is it takes in the state and then it takes in sort of the desired target. So you might not say just maximize the reward, you might explicitly tell it how much reward to get and then it incorporates this as the input to the action compared to just trying to predict the return. Efficient Net is a new neural network architecture for computer vision tasks like image classification, but also can be used as the backbone for feature extraction and things like object detection tasks, has been developed this year and is a really interesting approach to having this disciplined way of scaling up different model sizes. In this plot, you see the comparison of the Efficient Net uh, B0 up to B7, compared with a lot of uh, previous neural network architectures like the AmoebaNet C that was discovered through this large-scale evolution search, and then other things like the ResNext 101, uh, the Inception network, the Dense network, and all these previous iterations of image classification neural networks. So one of the most interesting characteristics of ImageNet is the introduction of compound scaling. 
So compound scaling searches for parameters to have a disciplined way of scaling up the size of models. So say you have this baseline neural network, and now you have more, uh, a larger computational budget, so you can afford to have a larger model. It's not necessarily clear, previous to this uh, paper, how you would scale up your neural network. You could scale up the width, which would mean adding more feature maps at each layer, the depth, adding more layers, or the resolution scaling, having a higher input resolution. So say going from an input of 384 by 384 up to 512 by 512. So compound scaling looks at a way to balance these different scaling up parameters, and it formulates this uh, family of efficient net models. And they also do things like searching for the, you know, these baseline cells, like the neural architecture cell search, in order to construct the building blocks of this efficient net. A similar approach to efficient net is taken in the development of efficient debt, also by developers at Google. You can see this plot showing the difference in efficiency and then the mean average precision score of the efficient net from the family of D1 up to D6 compared to these previous pipelines, things like mask RCNN or the pipeline of having the amoeba net image classification network to extract the features and then having the neural architecture search feature pyramid network to structure the way that you use the features extracted from a pre-trained image classifier into doing the bounding box object detection. So they describe how they structure their by FPN layer, comparing it with the previous uh, feature pyramid network, and then different sort of information flows of going from the different scales of feature maps extracted from the image classifier and the way that these feature maps are combined to make the decisions about the uh, regressive bounding box classifier. So they also introduce, similar to efficient net, a sort of compound scaling technique for scaling up the parameters with respect to having a larger computational budget. So you see how they go from using different uh, efficient net backbones. So you might say you use like the B1 efficient net, or if you have more computation, you'd use the uh, B7 efficient net. And then you'd have different ways of structuring the width of the uh, features in these by FPM layers, as well as the depth of the by FPM layers. Also in the space of neural architecture search, Google AI has developed a new model for mobile deep learning as well as edge deep learning, particularly for the TPU devices in MobileNet V3 and MobileNet Edge TPU. In this case, as you can see that they have this optimization for latency, you know, fast inference, and then having retaining a high accuracy despite sort of having this design for quick predictions. So they describe their search space that they use, the way that they structure their mobile net blocks, having these kinds of skip connections and different squeeze and excite kind of ways of having this information flow and uh, these convolutional filters to optimize for efficiency. And they also describe how when they optimize it for the edge TPU, they're kind of just optimizing it for the edge TPU. So they still haven't really figured out how to have this generalizable uh, sort of uh, efficiency optimization. Another interesting theme in AI in 2019 has been inspired by things like the debate between connectionist, which where you have these neural networks that just kind of reason in these vector spaces, compared to these symbolic AI systems, things like what the uh, Rubik's Cube solver and the OpenAI actually uses to solve the Rubik's Cube. So we've had things like debates between Yashua Bengio and uh, Gary Marcus, and there's been this great talk on uh, NeurIPS that's been released on Slides Live that is open access, anyone can watch this lecture. Uh, from System 1 Deep Learning to System 2 Deep Learning, inspired by this book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So this lecture talks about different ways to achieve sort of like consciousness in uh, these AI systems, reasoning that things like attention is sort of already a step towards this, things like having distributed representations and a lot of different ideas around how consciousness might arise from these AI systems. Some other interesting miscellaneous things from 2019 in AI that I thought were interesting were things like developments of the RAPIDS library, bringing a lot of traditional machine learning algorithms like TSNE and XGBoost to take advantage of GPUs. Another interesting article that came out was The Bitter Lesson by Richard Sutton, talking about how a lot of advances in AI are simply due to scaling up computing power. Another interesting trend in this year was the release of talks from ICLR, ICML, and NeurIPS on Slides Live so anyone can access them, which has been really cool. Another cool thing is the development of MB Dev from FastAI, a way of getting more out of using Jupyter Notebooks to create software and you know, do more things with writing your code in these Jupyter Notebooks. Another interesting framework that's been gaining popularity is Weights and Biases, which is this uh, visualization framework for doing things like hyperparameter optimization, which is a really cool visualization of testing things like, say, learning rate or number of layers or all these different kinds of hyperparameters that are associated with training deep learning models. Another interesting company has been Hugging Face, which has been developing these language models and creating these really great APIs that you can use with FastAI, uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, in order to you know, import these language models and their tokenizers 
and a lot of cool tutorials as well from their Medium posts that show you how to get started with using Hugging Face for custom tasks. The development of the TensorFlow and PyTorch programming frameworks for developing machine learning models and training these deep neural networks has also been a key theme to covering AI in 2019. The release of TensorFlow 2.0 brought a tighter integration with the Keras API on top of the TensorFlow backend, the Keras API making it much easier to get started with uh, TensorFlow. So another cool thing is the uh, distribution training strategy where you have this distributed training API that makes it as easy as adding a single line of code to take advantage of multi-GPUs. Another cool thing is they uh, tighten the saved model format and they have these different deployments at like things like TensorFlow Lite for deploying these TensorFlow models onto mobile phones and Raspberry Pi, as well as the TensorFlow.js for having uh, like the browser serve these models. PyTorch 1.3 also brought a lot of interesting updates to the PyTorch library for building neural networks. They begin their documentation by citing the growth of PyTorch citations and archive, and you can see other reports on how much uh, the use of PyTorch in the research community is growing. In PyTorch 1.3, they start off by restructuring the way that they have the name tensors, having this new format for naming the tensors and then indexing them when you're you know, doing things like concatenating or slicing out tensors and this kind of thing for training these deep neural networks. They also introduce this experimental quantization library and the mobile deployment, and they have a lot of these cool libraries like the Captum for sort of attribution and interpretability, uh, the Krypton, the Detectron 2, which is like these... Uh, vision models from Facebook that have been integrated with PyTorch, and then other things like fair sequence for speech extensions. There's been a lot of interesting growth in PyTorch, things like uh, the PyTorch Lightning API, similar to kind of like Fast.ai a little bit, having this Keras-like framework that makes it easier to get started with PyTorch. This article from The Gradient that came out just after the release of the PyTorch 1.3 library covers a lot of interesting facts about the state of machine learning frameworks in 2019. You can see these charts showing the growth of PyTorch and the growth of TensorFlow. So you can see that in different popular conferences like CVPR and then uh, NLP conferences like NAACL, ACL, and then machine learning conferences like ICLR and ICML. The growth of PyTorch is almost always above 200%, and then you know TensorFlow is being cited less and less. It's sort of showing the trend in papers that cite PyTorch and papers that cite TensorFlow for doing their experiments. Kaggle.com has listed a $1 million prize competition to the Deepfake Detection Challenge sponsored by companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft. The idea of the Kaggle Deepfake competition is well described in this introduction notebook from Rob Mola. You have these kinds of uh, deepfakes where you have the original video, and then you have the deepfakes where you sort of morph the face and things like this, or you make them say things that they haven't actually said. And the idea is to try to train like a classifier or something like that that can tell if the videos or the images are real or fake. So it's really interesting to see this kind of uh, deep fake thing becoming so uh, mainstream into combating it, sort of similar to the discussion around GPT-2 and having, you know, preventing preventative measures for having people maliciously use these language models to write text and also using these generative models to generate fake videos, people saying things they haven't actually said, and things like this. There's been a lot of interesting position papers and talks that have come out about the path towards artificial general intelligence. This paper from Francois Chalet, the creator of Keras, gained a lot of steam on the measure of intelligence. This talks about the problems of measuring AI based on skill acquisition. So things like image net classification compared to human standards, or these different uh, games like AlphaStar, uh, OpenAI Gym, all these different kinds of control tasks that compare neural networks and deep learning and AI with human performance. And then things like the SQUAD, the Stanford Question Answering Dataset that uh, you know compares like reading comprehension and answer between humans and then these language models. So it's an interesting paper describing uh, a way of measuring AGI as the ability to acquire skills and then producing this uh, data set and task, the abstraction and reasoning corpus to measure the way that you can acquire skills. Another interesting position paper from Jeff Kloon is AIGAs, describing a framework for producing general AI. And one interesting uh, like quote that they use to describe their uh, algorithms and their thinking with this research group is they describe what if you had an algorithm that would be interesting to run forever. You know, like a lot of these algorithms wouldn't be interesting if you say ran them for a million years. So they describe this framework of having meta-learning architectures, you know, things like neural architecture search or the neuroevolution of augmenting topologies, meta-learning the learning algorithms themselves. So, you know, having this step up where you have the optimization of the meta-learning controller algorithm and then generating effective learning environments. So they've had things like their POET paired open-ended trailblazers where they have the different learning environments that the agent is choosing, like, you know, what kind of a 
course the bipedal walking engine wants to walk on, and then in generative teaching networks, they generate the data set that's used to train the neural network. Another interesting talk sort of on the AGI front is this idea again from Yashua Bengio from System 1 Deep Learning to System 2, sort of the idea of how can you combine perception as well as reasoning into these systems.